Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another episode of ILLN Opinion Plus, a series airing on Fridays. This is a space for our opinions, where we talk about current events and the questions the Latino community is curious about. Today, we're joined by Dr. Robert Rodriguez, founder and president of DRR Advisors. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks, Annabelle. Excited to be here with you and all your listeners. So you're considered a thought leader in diversity and inclusion. What's most important to you in holding these types of discussions that can sometimes be a little difficult to have? Uh, yeah, some of them are, <laughs> in fact, quite difficult. Well, you know, the, the three things that tend to come up mostly that sometimes are a bit challenging are uh, things related to metrics and measurements, right? You know, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, this isn't really a stance. It's not a, you know, a philosophy. It's it, it's a skill. It's a capability that companies can, you know, leverage and, and, and you know, improve upon and stuff. So uh, even though I oftentimes talk with companies about their diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion initiatives, uh, they, they don't always have metrics, you know, to, to say, hey, things are uh, getting better or things are, are slipping, right? So, you know, that's uh, sometimes a difficult conversation to have, uh, metrics, because sometimes the, the things are not easy to measure. Uh, the second one is, is always resources. You know, a lot of companies say, hey, this is very important to us and diversity is a key priority. But then when I ask well, how much uh, in resources they allocated to it, it's like, oh, well, Geez, you know, times are tough, right? So, you know, which, which tells you um, in many cases how serious companies are. Uh, and then the third thing I would say, Annabelle, is uh, regarding accountability. You know, if, you know if, if an organization does have certain metrics related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and the company doesn't meet those metrics, you know, are, are people held accountable, right? Just like I think they should, just like if a company doesn't meet their sales numbers, their safety numbers, People are held to account. That's not always the case for DNI. So those those would be the three things that are sometimes challenging: metrics, resources, and uh, accountability. You're already touching on some of the other questions that I was going to ask you. But <laughs> okay. as far as metrics, like what's a good way to kind of count the way companies are moving? Uh, what, what you know, probably the most common one is representation, right? You know, what percentage of our leaders are are, are women or, or people from historically underrepresented groups? You know, that's one way you know another metric i've seen has been uh related to supplier diversity right you know sometimes you know companies will say hey do we have vendors that are women-owned businesses you know hispanic-owned businesses you know how much spend uh are we allocating towards these companies you know that that that's a metric uh and then things like you know promotional velocity retention uh those sorts of things are all metrics that companies sometimes have in place to kind of gauge how much progress they're making in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you've been doing this type of work for some time now. Mm -hmm. And I often talk about this recent push that we've noticed or that we've seen, right? Mm -hmm. Where companies are attempting to be more inclusive or, you know, that's great, but it seems sometimes like they talk about wanting to be inclusive. It's more like an attempt to look more inclusive rather than actually be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've noticed too? Yeah, you know, definitely the narrative has shifted lately you know as you mentioned i work with many companies regarding their latino town initiatives and and annabelle a lot of times probably the best way i can outline what you described is companies will call me mm -hmm. uh, and they'll say robert we don't have enough hispanics in leadership roles uh, but when they call me what what they're actually saying is robert come on in and fix those latinos would you because oh. they're not assertive enough they're not aggressive enough they're not willing to relocate some of them have an accent and and, and, and here's where the shift comes is because before companies used to take the approach of, well, Latinos are deficient. They're not, you know, they're not, you know, they're not doing well. So that's why they're not in leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those, that approach is unfortunately still around at some companies, but where I've seen some of the shift is companies, when they call me, aren't saying Robert fix those Latinos because we're not broke, right? I, I'm not right. fixing anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the companies that get it are the ones that say, Robert, help us, help us as an organization that cr will create the conditions that nurture their success, right? Mm -hmm. So help us improve the systems that we have in place regarding identifying top talent. Help us, you know, make sure that Latinos aren't over mentored and under sponsored, right? So so that's where you start to see the companies who really get it are. are 
they're taking more accountability for their lack of representation uh, and not just blaming the, the community, but saying, hey, we're not doing something right that allows them to, you know, that to allows them to flourish within our organization. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I wish more companies have taken that approach, but at, at least uh, we're seeing some positive movement. And that accountability that you're referring to, that can be hard, right? To kind of self-reflect and be like, mm, I think actually the problem is internal. Yeah, yeah. And 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 what what's starting to happen because of that, Annabelle, is is for example, you know, I'm getting requests from companies who say, Robert, can you do, can you help curate a, an immersion experience for us? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right before COVID, for example, I had a a, a client that there's a, a bank, right? And and they have, you know, they they service the Hispanic Latino community. Uh, so this bank, they uh, pulled together their entire leadership team, as well as their as well as their board of directors, and I I curated a whole Latino immersion experience for them. So I, Friday night we went out to dinner in the Pilsen neighborhood here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Right, we brought in Maria Inojosa from uh, mm-hmm. Latinos USA. Saturday we kind of spent in the Humboldt Park neighborhood, predominantly Puerto Rican community. Right, we walked up and down uh, Paseo Boricua. They met some, you know, uh, Hispanic business owners. Then we went to Little Village, met with the Little Village Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We had a panel with uh, Latino nonprofit owners. Then we had dinner at Danta, a Peruvian restaurant, and had a panel with uh, Latinos and Latinos on corporate boards. And then on Sunday, we spent it at the National Museum of Mexican Art, brought in uh, Sylvia Puentes from the Latino Policy Forum. And then they wrapped it up. So Annabelle, after that weekend, their executive said, Hey, I know so much more about this community that I didn't know before. Uh, it's helped to dispel some myths that you know I had. Uh, I have a much more textured understanding of the community, and with that insight, now they know that they can service the Latino community better. So that's an example of this shift that mm-hmm. we're seeing in companies, and I hope uh, more companies follow that lead. That sounds amazing because I think mm-hmm. they learned so much through that, right? And education Absolutely. is power. Knowledge is power. Yeah, and yeah. I've heard you talk about the need for Latinos to view their ethnicity as a strength and as a source of power. What does that mean? Well, you know, yeah, that you know, a lot of that. When I refer to that part of that's been my own journey, right? You know, I'm I'm proud Mexican American. My parents are originally from Matamoros in Mexico. They came to the U.S., became U.S. citizens, and I was born in the great state of Texas, so soy Tejano. Uh, but I grew up in the Midwest. And I grew up in Minnesota. Uh, to be exact. And, and Minnesota is a great place to live, great place to raise a family. But Annabelle, when I was growing up, there weren't a lot of Latinos in, yeah. in Minnesota. So so I struggled a bit of, with my sense of identity, right? You know, my parents, you know, God bless them. They're well-intentioned, but they're telling me things like, oh, mijo, no hablas español. Just fit in, assimilate, you know, go play hockey with the Anglo kids. Right? And, and, yeah. and that's what I did. But when I got to corporate America, Annabelle, there was this this feeling that being Latino made me less than, mm-hmm. right? There's some folks who are saying, oh, Robert, you only got hired because of affirmative action or, you know, we, you know, oh, you're the token Latino, right? So I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't embrace my Hispanic heritage, right? I was never ashamed of it. I just didn't see it as something that served me well, right? Mm-hmm. But finally, I, I got woke, I, you know, I, I matured and I said, no, my, my Hispanic heritage is an asset, is a source of strength because my you know, Hispanic background is more relevant than ever before, right? You know, because of our growing population, because of our growing consumer spend. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that I, I, I have a, glo- a bi-global or kind of a more bi- bicultural perspective, you know, somewhat bilingual, I have that global mindset. But most importantly, Annabelle, it, it allowed me just to be much more comfortable in my own skin. And, mm-hmm. and that's why when I, t- I talk to young Latinos and Latinas, Latinx, Latin, whatever term you may prefer, you know, I tell them, hey, you don't have to j- jump up and down and tell everybody you're Latino if you don't want to, mm-hmm. right? You know, if you want to be unapologetically Latino, go for it. If you want to downplay your ethnicity, uh, that's okay too. You know, who will mind to judge? But what I tell folks is whatever your sense of identity is, you own it. Mm-hmm. You determine it. Don't let somebody else determine it for you. And as I've talked to many young Hispanics, that's what they're finding. It's like, Robert, yes, my, you know, my Hispanic background is, is, is help me out. You know, I, I know more about the Latino community than lots of my colleagues do. I, you know, that, that the fact that I am bilingual is great. So it's, it's those sorts of things that I think young Latinos and Latinas are seeing it, realizing that, 
hey, this is important to leverage my heritage. For sure. And I think that what you're talking about, that sense of identity and like not holding your sense of identity or not trying to live up to someone else's yep. identity, especially for like people like us who are bicultural, right? I'm mm -hmm. Mexican American as well, grew up in the United States. If I go to Mexico, I'm not Mexican enough. Yeah. If I'm here, I'm not American enough. And it, it can cause a lot of, um, I guess, like inner turmoil of like, well, where do I fit? Where do I belong? Who am well, I? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's why you know, one of the things that I learned when researching my book is that there is such a thing, unfortunately, in, in what I call them as intra-Latino divides, mm -hmm. that because of the diversity in our community, sometimes we always don't always support each other, right? You know, you'll see the blonde hair, blue eyed Latino maybe looks down on the Afro-Latino and the Afro-Latino maybe looks down on the, you know, those of us who are more indigenous. There's the oh, you're from Mexico, I'm from Argentina, right? Sometimes it's nationality, right? Sometimes it's Spanish proficiency. Oh, do you know hablas español muy bien? So you're not a real Latino, right? Or you don't speak Portuguese or whatever, or you have an accent. Um, immigration. Oh, I was born here, you immigrated here. And then finally, that, that sense of identity, the fact that some of us embrace it, others not so much. So that was one of the big findings from my book is, the realization that that exists. And, and I think the more we overcome that, Annabelle, I think we'll be able to tap into more of that, you know, communal spirit, mm -hmm. right? And that's come up a lot lately with this whole Latinx kind of term. You know, there's some folks who embrace it, love it, others not so much. My philosophy is, hey, whatever term works best for you, like, hey, like, who am I to judge that, right? It may not be my preferred term, but, but I get bother when I see some folks say, oh, you lose it Latinx, shame on you. That's not even a word. I'm like, who are you to make that call? Right. So mm -hmm. those are some of the things as we move forward as a community, we'll tap into more of that communal spirit and make sure that those intra Latino divides don't keep us from uh moving forward and 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 uh kind of coming together as as a group. Right. Let's mm -hmm. talk about your book, Authentico, the definitive mm -hmm. guide to Latino career yep. success. What motivated you to write it? Because I know you didn't uh, before what motivated you yeah, to write well there's a couple things one is you know when i got my my doctorate uh one of the reasons i went and got my phd is i never once had a latino latino professor mm -hmm. in business school so i didn't like that yeah so i said well I'd, I'd like to change that um and then you know when i was going through that struggle with my sense of identity right i was looking for books that might help me on it and i didn't see any books on it right so you know, fortunately, because I had the PhD, I had good relationships with publishers and I was able to write my first book way back in 2008. Right. Um, and, and the reason I wrote it is because I, I think there was a story that needed to be told. Right. That, you know, we are a powerful community that, uh, you know, that we contribute a lot to this society and uh, that, you know, we, we are a callus for economic growth. Right. So, you know, now that I've written, you know, three books. You know, I'm super excited now to see more and more Latinos and Latinos writing books and getting, you know, published because, you know, yeah, we, our stories need to be told. Uh, and I'm glad that there's an audience for, for those books. Really quickly, Robert, mm -hmm. do you have any resources for our viewers and where can we get the book? Uh, well, you know, resources, you know, just go to my website, drradvisors.com. You can find out, you know, resources, not just about the work I do, but some of the books that I've written. Uh, best way to, to get the books is probably Amazon. You know, if you look up Dr. Robert Rodriguez, you'll see my three books, Employee Resource Group Excellence, Authentico, The Definitive Guide to Latino Career Success that I co-wrote with Andres Tapia, and my first book that I met, just mentioned, Latino Town, Effective Strategies to Recruit, Retain, and Develop Hispanic Professionals. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for being our guest. Oh, it's been an honor to be the subject of your grace and favor. Join us next time for another episode. For more information about our discussion today, check out our web story on ilatinonews.com and follow us on Twitter at ilatinonews. I'm Annabelle Rocha with ILLN Opinion Plus. See you next time.